everyone. My name is Olivia Matt, and I'm president of the Souza Mendez Foundation. I'm delighted that you have joined us for today's inspiring program on Jonathan on, on uh, Joachim Prinz. We have his son here, Jonathan, but we're speaking about Joachim Prinz, um, the civil rights leader who took the lessons he had learned from his life in Berlin under the Nazi regime. And he brought them to America where he became a very important hero of civil rights and um, of African-American history and really American history. So um, today's program is part of our series of stories of rescue and resistance and hope that we've been running every Sunday since the COVID period began. Um, today, I wanted a very, very uplifting and strong program to fortify you right before the election. So I do hope that the film was meaningful to you and certainly you'll be inspired by today's speakers. Michael Meyer, who is the world's expert on uh, Joachim Prinz and his action. We have Rachel Fisher, who made a fabulous film uh, called Joachim Prinz, I Shall Not Be Silent. And we have Jonathan Prinz, the son of the hero, who is here to tell us what kind of a man his father was and what lessons from his father can inspire us today. So let's start with Professor Michael Meyer. Michael, how are you today? Very well, thank you. Why don't you uh, tell us what you would like to say about John, about uh, Joachim Prince? Indeed. Uh, it is for me really uh, an honor and a pleasure to be part of this program this afternoon because there is a interesting personal link between D'Souza Mendes uh, and myself. D'Souza Mendes, of course, courageously wrote out visas for Jews in the south of France under Nazi occupation, enabling them to get to neutral Portugal as the Count's Consul for Portugal in Bordeaux. He saved many Jewish lives. When he was doing so, I was living in Nazi Germany as a small child in Berlin. My parents made every effort to get a visa to a country where they could be safe. But again and again, they were frustrated until finally it became possible for them to leave Germany via the Iberian Peninsula, via Spain. So even as de Souza Mendes was able to save Jews via the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal, I was saved via that same peninsula, via Barcelona and on to the United States. The person that we are talking about this afternoon, Rabbi Joachim Prince, is like de Souza Mendes in that he too was a man of great courage. He was living in Nazi Germany at a very difficult time indeed. It was a time when it was necessary for a rabbi in Nazi Germany to do two things at the same time, which Prince did. First, he had to tell people the whole truth, lest they have illusions, lest they believe that one day the German people would reject Hitler and they would be safe. And even as he was a truth teller, he at the same time had to make sure that they did not fall into despair, having heard that truth, that they would not commit suicide as unfortunately many of them did. That took tremendous strength on his part to maintain morale, even while you are telling the ugly truth. Rabbi Prince was the rabbi of a congregation which my parents frequently attended in Berlin at the Friedens Temple. There, Jews gathered in huge numbers during the Nazi period because they felt that there they could be among themselves. That was a safe place. 
it was a safe place despite the fact that at every service there were two men in the front row wearing bowler hats who represented the Gestapo, who were there to make sure that nothing was said against the Nazi regime. But that didn't stop Prince. He just did it in a roundabout way. When he spoke of Jewish holidays, like for example, Purim, the holiday recounted, whose story is recounted in the biblical book of Esther. The villain of that story is Haman, whose name begins with an H. Well, when Prince said a Haman, everybody knew he really meant Hitler. And when the holiday of Passover came around, and Prince spoke about Passover and the exodus from ancient Egypt, the Israelites leaving the slavery of Egypt to go to the free land of Canaan, his listeners knew that Germany, Nazi Germany, was the new enslavement, the new Egypt. In those days, a Jewish community in Germany that had largely been assimilated, that knew very little about its own faith, wanted to know more. The Nazis are defining us as Jews. What does that mean to us? And so there was a bit of a religious revival. And Joachim Prince was a very much a part of that. He gave lectures on Jewish history and Jews of Germany came by the thousands to hear the lectures. But that revival, as Prince tells us in his autobiography, did not last. By the time Prince was forced to flee Germany in 1937, the situation had changed. People didn't have the patience any longer to go to lectures. One thing was on their mind and that was one thing and one thing alone. And that was how do we get out of here? Where do we get a visa? How do we save our lives? In 1938, 32 nations of the world gathered in the French resort town of Evian-les-Bains in order to try to find solutions for the oppressed German Jews. How would they be able to leave Germany and get a visa to someplace where they could live? With the exception of the Dominican Republic, no nation was willing to increase its quota. And we almost were trapped in Germany. But it was men like the Sousa Mendes and Joachim Prince who had the courage to act on behalf of their own people, but, and this is perhaps the most important tie between them, not only for their own people, but for others who were not of their people. De Souza Mendes was a Portuguese Christian, and yet he saved thousands of Jewish lives at risk to his own life. And Joachim Prince, having come to the United States, having escaped Germany, devoted himself likewise to a group that was not his own. Yes, he was involved with his fellow Jews, but he also devoted himself to the civil rights movement and to improving the lot of black Americans, of African Americans in the United States. So I think it makes a lot of sense for the Sousa Foundation to tie itself to Joachim Prince, for these two men were similar in their courage. Now to tell you more about Prince, not only in Germany, but perhaps especially in the United States, I'm glad to give the floor over to the one of the two directors of the wonderful film about Joachim Prince, which many of you have seen, Rachel Fisher, it's all yours. Thank you, and thank you all for having me. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be a part of, of the afternoon, and, and thank you all for watching the film. Um, I'm often asked why my co-producer, Rachel Pasternak, and I 
made this film. Um, and we've been asked this for so many years that we have a couple different versions uh, of a response. Um, but today I'm gonna share something a little bit more personal um, and perhaps the closest to the truth about why I wanted to make this film. Um, so one hot summer day, and I think it was about 2007, Rachel Pasternak um, showed me a printout of Rabbi Prince's speech at the March on Washington, which was given, of course, in 1963, um, which was um, six years before I was born. And I read the speech. She, she wanted to know if I wanted to work on a project about, about Prince, um, but I had never heard of him. I read his speech, which many of you saw in the film, and even though it had been delivered before my birth, I felt like I had been waiting my whole life to hear the words that Prince said. Um, I am from Philadelphia, and two weeks before I was born, my parents moved into our home in the Mount Airy neighborhood of Philadelphia. And I noticed on the list that there's someone here from, from the neighborhood, from the synagogue in the neighborhood. Um, Mount Airy is one of the few intentionally integrated neighborhoods in the entire country. So I grew up, of course, I didn't know that as a child. I thought the way we lived was normal. What I knew was block parties, barefoot kickball games on the street, and double dutch. What I knew was walking around the corner to the Lincoln Drive Deli, where you could get Italian hoagies and Jewish pickles, and where right next to the cash register, there was a huge glass jar of jellied pig's feet, which is a delicacy of the Black South. So that was the context in which I grew up. And here's the thing about being a neighbor. When you're neighbors, you need each other and you're part of each other's lives. Um, our houses were small and they were semi-attached and they were close together. So if, if your neighbor's house is burning down, your house is gonna burn down too. So in my neighborhood, we were, as Martin Luther King said in his letter from a Birmingham jail, quote, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. The difference is that we weren't caught in this network of mutuality. We had woven ourselves into it intentionally. By choosing to be neighbors in a geographic sense, I was raised trying to live out the moral concept of being a neighbor that Rabbi Prince talks about in his speech at the March on Washington. And that's why when I read his speech, I felt that he was expressing something that I had always known, but that I had never really heard fully articulated before. One of my neighbors was a black man named James. James lived up the street with his father, Mr. Brooks. Mr. Brooks was very slender and very gentle and us kids would always greet him with a sing song, good morning, Mr. Brooks. And he would give us a kind smile in return. James was usually withdrawn. And as we would say as kids, he was in his own world. Every so often, James would have a psychotic breakdown. A few times his father had to call the police because James was out of control. When I got old enough, I asked my father why James would have these breakdowns. And he told me that James had been, been in Vietnam. This past week, Walter Wallace Jr. of Philadelphia, a black man, was shot and killed by police as he was having a mental health crisis and carrying a knife. When I see the video of Walter Wallace and the end of his life, I see James. I see my neighbor someone with whom I am woven in a network of mutuality. And that's what integration makes possible. And that's what Rabbi Prince was calling for when he said that neighbor is not a geographic term, but a moral concept. Thank you.
So I'm going to now turn things over to Jonathan. Um, I want to say that Rachel Pasternak and I were extremely honored and fortunate to have the great support of the Prince family and Professor Meyer when we were making our film, something we'll always be grateful for. It was a combination of support along with um, giving us total editorial and artistic freedom. So we had a wonderful collaboration with the family and with experts like Professor Meyer, and I really appreciate that. We're gonna start out seeing a photo of Jonathan with his father um, that I encouraged him to include because it sort of symbolizes, I think, some of the passing on of, of ideas and values that, um, that Jonathan experienced from his father. So let me begin by saying how pleased I am to be with Rachel and Michael. Um, Michael took a manuscript, an unpublished manuscript of my father's autobiography and brought it to life. And added to that a very incisive and important introduction and I'm forever grateful to him for it. And the Rachels, we call them the Rachels. <laughs> and the Rachels uh, have produced a film that every time I watch it, and I've watched it often, I'm moved by it. So uh, I wanna thank them as well. <coughs> you know, one of the things that happens to you if you have someone like my father is that people say, well, what would he have said at this moment, at this quite extraordinary moment, really? And, you know, historians are always asked that question. Michael knows that well as a historian. What would so-and-so have said at a time like this? And, you know, for the historian, it's always a bit of a guess. And um, I think that you might say that for me, when I answer that question, it's sort of a guess, but in fact, it's not. And that had something to do with the fact a very close relationship that my father and I had. And when he died, um, I was very sad, obviously, but one of the things that I felt very strongly was that there was never an unsaid word between us. There was never anything to finish, it was all there. And uh, so I had this very close relationship with him and also we, for a period of time, shared a pulpit together. So we were both colleagues and, and father and son. But I do want to say to put this in context that if you ask any of my siblings, they will also tell you that they had this intimate relationship with him. And that tells you who he was. Uh, you know, some people who have um, uh, achieved some notoriety and uh, people who, uh, for example, people orators who are used to speaking to large audiences, when they get down to the intimate audience, they, they just fall apart, they're not there. He was always there. He was very present. So in, a, in answer to the question, what would he be saying about this extraordinary time? I think the first thing he would say is deja vu. He'd seen this movie before. And that's um, kind of shocking, isn't it? That we are living in a time where he would say, I've seen this movie before. I've heard this kind of demagoguery before. I've seen this kind of racism, racism before. You have to remember that Hitler saw Jews as a race. It was a racial thing. It was not a religious thing, it was a racial thing. It's also a religious thing, but a racial thing. So we're in this now. And my father was a great student of history. Um, he, he would uh, 
he always spoke without notes. He preached without notes. And he could quote dates, <laughs> most obscure dates from memory. He was a, so history was very important to him. But he was always a person of now, of this moment. He was never someone lost in the past. He was always in the moment. And in this moment, to use a cliche, he would recognize there was an elephant in the room, literally an elephant in the room. I think we're living in a very dangerous, a very disturbing time. And if you're like I am, and you probably are, you probably haven't slept well in weeks. And as we get to the moment, sleep even worse. Um, it is a commentary, I think, on what happens with human beings. But I think the most disturbing thing about it is it says something about our country. We, you know, this is a country with a lot of myth and a lot of dreams. And, um, you know, the greatest, the greatest country in the world, that whatever that means. And I think that that shatters, this time has shattered a lot of that myth and reminded us. And hopefully will remind us in a creative way to activate ourselves. And he was always also an activist. He would have been out there on those streets. He would have been talking about Black Lives Matter. And he would have been talking loudly about it uh, as he talked loudly about Hitler during the Hitler regime, whatever, whatever um, uh, words he used to mask uh, for those who didn't understand, to mask what he was saying. But he was, he was fearless. And he would be out there today and being fearless and working very hard to, um, to sort of correct things, to correct tikkun olam, to create to, to improve uh, the world uh, that he was in. So with that, let me go back to you, Olivia, maybe. Um, sure, yes, people are starting to put their questions in the chat box, which is wonderful. We're gonna get to those in a little while. So do please keep putting your questions in there. So um, I welcome our panelists to have a, a dialogue if there are things you'd like to discuss amongst yourselves. I, I would like to ask Jonathan. Jonathan, you spoke about certain issues that Prince would have been involved in uh, as he was involved with the African-Americans. One of the issues that Americans are grappling with and both sides are, are represented is the issue of immigration which I would think would be an issue of particular consequence to Prince having been an immigrant to the United States as I was an immigrant to the United States. Um, try to imagine him giving a sermon on immigration, John. Yeah. What would he have said? Yeah, well, let me start by saying that I would be an anchor baby. I was born one month after my parents arrived in the United States. My mother was pregnant with me. Um, so I would be an anchor baby. I'd be one of those children that uh, the current administration questions whether I should even be a citizen. Um, I, immigration would, of course, was a very important issue for him. And Michael, you alluded to the fact that people couldn't, there were quotas and people couldn't get into the country. Um, he was uh, he was fortunate that uh, he had sponsors, uh, which made it possible for him to come here. But he understood that uh, immigration was kind of the essence of the country. It was made up of immigrants, of of which he was one. You know, it's interesting. The March on Washington speech. He begins that speech with the words, "I speak to you as an American." Jew. And it's significant that he said American before he said Jew. Because he totally identified with being an American. And isn't that the story of American immigrants? People who have come here 
don't they identify themselves strongly? As a matter of fact, sometimes even more strongly than those of us, those who, who are citizens, who were born citizens and sometimes take it for granted. So he would be talking out very strongly about the immigration issue. He would be appalled by what was going on and, he, and he, would, he would be very vocal about it. Rachel, is there anything you'd like to say? You want to jump in here? Sure, I mean, I, there's one story that's not in the film that people might be interested in that I think gives us a clue as to how Rabbi Prince would be feeling and how he'd be talking right now. Um, when Goldwater was running for president, Rabbi Prince um, broke the rules as he was wont to do and said in a sermon at his temple that a vote for Goldwater was a vote for Jewish suicide. Um, this was an extremely controversial thing for him to do, an extremely controversial thing for him to say. We found in the archives many letters of protest and condemnation that were written to him after he made this statement, um, asking how he could say this and saying that it was inappropriate um, for him to say this. I think that it really illustrates his understanding of how oppressed people are tied together and how interdependent we all are. Why would a vote for Goldwater be a vote for Jewish suicide? Goldwater didn't have a problem with the Jews. In fact, he had Jewish ancestry. Um, so why would that be Jewish suicide? Why would that be against Jewish interests or quote, bad for the Jews to support Goldwater? Well, if you support, um, if you're supporting someone who is themselves supported by, um, you know, organized racists um, and, and whose politics are those which are trying to maintain a status quo in which, you know, white Christians are more powerful than everybody else, um, then even if that person, that individual might be nice to the Jews, good to the Jews, say that they like Jews, you are really undermining your own survival. Um, and he really believed that it was democracy and that it was this beautiful mosaic of everyone having their own identity and having self-esteem about their own identity and enjoying other people's differences. Um, that that's what, that's really the only situation in which Jews in the end would be safe. Yeah, you know, uh, I obviously listened to that sermon and uh, it, it, was a, it was a big decision for him to do that. Uh, he had never done that before and uh, never did it after. That doesn't mean that he didn't have political uh, feelings, he did, and candidates that he favored, he did, but he felt that Goldwater was really an exception. Uh, and I think he would be doing the same thing today, of course. Uh, and in many ways, Goldwater uh, and that candidacy uh, foretold what we're in today. You know, that's really kind of where it began in, in many ways. And, uh, and he was moved to speak out. And that was this, you know, it was the same thing that made him speak out in Germany. Uh, a, a sense of outrage and, and a sense also of danger. He understood what was dangerous and Goldwater to him was dangerous. They, they, had, they had a very gentlemanly exchange of letters, uh, Rabbi Prince and Goldwater after the election. Um, and it's, it's in the archives where Goldwater wrote to him 
and said, you know, how could you say this about me? Yes. And your father wrote back to him and explained, <laughs> very politely explained yes. that he thought he thought Goldwater was a danger to democracy. I'd like to bring in uh, one other aspect. Um, there is a uh, section in the film which talks about it, but I think it's important to mention it. When Prince first came to the United States, he was invited to a Jewish group in Atlanta, Georgia. And he discovered to his great dismay that there were Jews in Atlanta, Georgia who were no less prejudiced against blacks as were some of their Christian neighbors. So that Prince not only castigated America for its attitude to its minorities, he was also willing to castigate his own people, his fellow Jews, when they were prejudicial, when they were not living up to the highest uh, ideals of Judaism. So I think that also needs to be mentioned. You know, we in the last few days, we've been reminded of the talk that uh, black families have. Um, and I call this, this particular incident, the moment. Mm -hmm. I think for him, this was the moment. Uh, he had, what happened is he was, he would, went to Atlanta to speak to a group of Jews about what was going on in Germany. And he had um, met before uh, with a, uh, the president of a black university, uh, the first Dr. King that he was involved with, uh, which is kind of interesting. And they were outraged that he did that. Uh, they said, we hear that you uh, were with that using the N word. And he was taken aback. He was absolutely taken aback. And uh, they finally said to him, well, would you like a drink? And he was thinking scotch and they offered him a Coke. And from that day until the March on Washington, he never had a Coke again. But Cokes were available after the March and we sat, we were behind the, the Lincoln Memorial and he drank a Coke because we were all so thirsty. <laughs> you know, this, this conversation that we're having reminds me of something that I just read today. I was reading the book Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, it's just come out and she's making the argument that the racial hierarchy in the United States is a kind of caste system like in India where the untouchables were the lowest caste. And she also makes the analogy to the caste system of Nazi Germany where Jews were the lowest caste. Really right. Untouchables. Mm -hmm. Exactly, the untouchables. And it made me think of two things. One is the um, moment in our film when Professor Clement Price of Blessed Memory um, says that as a Jew, Rabbi Prince understood the African-American experience of being uh, permanently kept at the bottom. And I think that there's this interesting, and there was a story in the book cast about Martin Luther King going to India and dining with the prime minister and meeting all kinds of important people, and then going to visit a group of un untouchables of the lowest caste people and having their leader introduce him and say, he's an untouchable too. And at first, King was a little bit like, I'm not an untouchable. I just had dinner with the prime minister. And then he realized that in America, he was an untouchable. And I think Prince had this really interesting, as did many people, and Michael, maybe you can speak to this some, and Jonathan, maybe from either your personal experience or your parents' experience, this really interesting identity um, experience of being an untouchable in Germany and coming to America and being white. So it, it's this very complicated thing where you have to figure out where your identification lies. 
am I going to identify with the untouchables of America? Or am I going to identify with the upper caste that I may have the opportunity to actually join as a white person? And I think that's emblematic of, you know, the Jewish experience in America and the experience of other immigrant groups as well. Um, and I thought it was really interesting that even Martin Luther King had this moment in India of thinking, maybe I could escape that untouchable status here. And then realizing, no, I will always identify with the people at the bottom. Right. Maybe I could pass. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask us to pause this fascinating discussion. I would like to take the floor back just to tell you a little bit, tell our audience a little bit about our upcoming programs, which will be on the other side of this election. So, um, so anyway, let me tell you about the next couple of weeks. So next week we have this very inspiring story about an American hero named Al Schwimmer that nobody's heard about. He was a TWA flight engineer who assembled uh, a group of pilots uh, to create the first Air Force for Israel, just as Israel was coming into existence. And so these pilots took it upon themselves against the laws of the United States and international law to actually rescue the newborn state of Israel. So that, uh, film is called A Wing and a Prayer, and it's a story you probably have never heard before. Uh, ben Gurion referred to Al Schwimmer as the greatest gift that America ever gave to Israel. Mm. So he's one of these unsung heroes that you're going to want to learn about. Then that's a free program, as a lot of our programs are. Then in two weeks, we have a program for which uh, tickets are required. The price of tickets is anything you would like it to be. It's by donation. We do suggest 18 representing life or high, but if you want to give more, you want to give less, that's entirely up to you. We're showing the film Duskind. We have the filmmaker uh, with us, as we usually do. Uh, Duskind won best film at uh, the European, European uh, Independent Film Festival. It's a, a fabulous piece of cinema. And so I'm gonna ask my colleague Matthew to play the trailer so that you can see what a dazzling film it is. So that'll be in two weeks. Il y a tant de choses à dire et je me sens si seule à combattre l'oubli. Qui c'est qui a pu prévoir une Shoah Antonescu a dit « Nu ți dau evrei mei, lui Hitler, mă ocup eu de ei. » Cette Shoah, ce n'est pas celle d'Auschwitz. Pas de calcul, pas d'industrialisation. Cette Nazi-Region est une organisée mordebande. Et je suis leur objectif de dîner. La résistance m'appelle. Je bascule dans l'anonymat et la clandestinité. Car tout cela allait de soi. Être communiste, prendre les armes et se battre. On était fiers qu'en tant que juifs, on était capable de les défier. turn my attention to the questions that have been accumulating in the chat box and I see there's quite a bit of controversy. Some people feel that today's program is political and um, there's discussion about well isn't there anti-semitism in Black Lives Matter. Uh, so obviously we have our audience from all kinds of political persuasions and we hope that the Joachim Prince story speaks to everyone. So um, maybe let's start there. And if our panelists can speak about um, this issue of our current political moment and whether there are some universal lessons to be found in the story of Prince. Well, I'd like to say something about the, the um, 
Black Lives Matter question, I think that Prince was very clear that um, human rights didn't depend on everyone um, being a great person. So for example, or, or, you know, that individuals in groups were perfect or, or weren't, didn't make mistakes. So I think that he believed in civil rights and human rights for African-Americans, regardless of whether or not individual African-Americans were anti-Semitic. Similarly, he, you know, advocated for a two-state solution and peace in Israel. It didn't mean that he felt that every Palestinian Arab loved Jews, um, but that didn't have anything to do with whether or not they were entitled to basic human rights. Similarly, as Jews, of course, there are individual Jews who are racist or Islamophobic. We would never think that they're not entitled to safety and security as a result of that. So human rights aren't contingent upon having this or that point of view. Um, similarly, I, I think, I don't think he would feel that, you know, he objected to Goldwater, but he would never have done anything to take away Goldwater's, you know, human rights or civil rights. Yeah, I think you also, and he always used to say that you have to love people, you don't have to like them. And that's how he went through life. Uh, loving people, but not necessarily liking them. Uh, he also, to the, to the concerns that some people have voiced that this has sort of gotten political, um, I, I think that he would have said, there are times where you have to do things that are uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, sometimes things are inconvenient. And this is, um, you know, this is a very different time. We have not had this. I was uh, talking to uh, my son and daughter-in-law today about the fact that I could not remember a time when a group of, uh, of uh, voters, of, of uh, uh, people who were following one candidate would get into their cars and surround a bus of the other candidate and try and drive it off the road. That's something new. I mean, that is not, I mean, certainly during the civil rights movement for different reasons, but I'm talking about Democrats and Republicans. You know, that's, that hasn't, these are extraordinary times. I think that one of the, the dangers of a time like this and, and one of the things that has happened in the last four years is that we kind of, you know, make this ordinary. We, we, we think this is regular and it's not, this is not usual. And uh, so sometimes in a moment like this, uh, one has to do things that wouldn't necessarily do at another time. Uh, you know, also in terms of, of, of problems of, of other people, my, my sister Deborah in the film uh, talks about the fact that some people were concerned uh, that he was involved, that he should be involved in Jewish things, Jewish problems. And she said, well, he thought civil rights was a Jewish problem. That, you know, this was, it, this was our thing too. And uh, yes, he, he would have uh, been unhappy and, and spoken out against uh, anti-Semitic statements by anyone, but that, that had nothing to do with the movement. It's like, it's like uh, talking about the riots instead of talking about the demonstrations. It's a, it's a way of, of um, making us think about something else, of, of deflecting what was really going on and what was important. I think he saw the demonstrations as the core and the riots as something that was to the side and was not and and should not make us lose the point of what we're talking about. We haven't oh. mentioned at all Vietnam, and yet Prince took an unpopular position in opposing the war in Vietnam from the very beginning, 
People said, you oppose that war, people are gonna say the Jews are unpatriotic. Uh, be quiet, don't be too loud in your opposition to the war because that will hurt the Jewish cause. And it really is to Prince's credit that that didn't stop him from taking a position that he believed was the moral one. Yes, and to be told to be quiet was the wrong thing to say to him. <laughs> right. So let's get to a few more of these questions. So Marlena in Pittsburgh, who's uh, from actually Tree of Life, that the synagogue that was attacked, she asked, why was Rabbi Prince expelled from Germany while others were not allowed to leave? Um, I, um, um, Michael may want to say something about that. I, I think that, remember this was, 1937, it was early in a way. And I think uh, they wanted to get rid of him because he attracted thousands and thousands of people, crowds. And uh, they really, they wanted to silence him. And uh, the, the best way to silence him really was to get rid of him. And that's why he, I mean, he was really expelled. He was told, pack up and you're leaving. And uh, I think it was, I think at that moment, uh, they felt he was kind of a danger to them. And uh, I mean, so kind of ridiculous in a way because they had, they, they had all the armaments. But, um, but I think that's really what, why, he was, uh, why he was expelled. So there's another question about the same moment about his emigration uh, and your emigration, I guess, in utero. Yes. Which is, um, Let's see, I just lost it, which is if he was such a Zionist, why didn't he go to Palestine? Why did he come to the United States? Yeah, that question is, is often asked. And I, I, I think there's a very simple answer to it, really. You know, being a rabbi and preaching and all of that was at his essence. It's who he was. And he couldn't have done that in, in Palestine. Uh, I mean, liberal, liberal Jews in Palestine, I mean, today you have some uh, reform rabbis that are, are uh, trained in, in Israel, but uh, Israel, Palestine was pretty hostile to, uh, to non-Orthodox Jews, religious Jews. And, and I think he just, uh, you know, what he did in life was something he really did with a passion and he would not have been able to do it there. And I think that's really the main reason. I mean, he was, you know, all the founders were friends of his, but he, uh, he decided to come to the United States. Okay, so there's a question here from Liz Page. Could you speak to Rabbi Prince's concern for Palestinians in greater detail than what was in the film, please? Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, I, I'll start with that. Uh, Michael? Yeah, uh, Prince was, as was mentioned, a, a fervent Zionist and he continued to be that in the United States and worked for the benefit of the state of Israel throughout his entire life. But he was also what we would call today a dove. That is to say, he believed very strongly that there should be a peace settlement between Israel uh, and the Palestinians. Uh, he favored something like the two-state solution uh, and he was very concerned when people on the right wing in Israel did not share his belief that we are Jews and we're Arabs, but we're ultimately human beings. And uh, that made him unpopular in certain right wing circles, both in the United States and in Israel. But he had a great deal of support from liberal Jews in the United States for his position. Um, even though uh, there were um, right-wing Zionists who, who condemned him. There was an organization uh, called Breira um, that I was actually associated with, which uh, at ahead of its time believed that it was important to recognize uh, the Palestinians as a nation with national rights. So Prince was a fervent Zionist but he was a Zionist on the left wing of Zionism. Would you agree, Jonathan? Yes, and he would be uh, a, a leading member of J Street. Today. That's, that's where he was. And um, he was always to the left of, the, of that uh, Jewish establishment. And that, I think that's even compounded today. He was uh, one of the 
early signers of Shalom Achshav, of Peace Now, uh, long before it became a thing. And so, yes, he felt very strongly about that. And it would be a, was a very strong proponent of, uh, at that time, it really wasn't called the two-state solution, but essentially that. So I'm going to add my own question, which is that I have to confess that before seeing Rachel's film, I had never heard of Rabbi Joachim Prince. So I would like to ask our three panelists, and I suspect that that might be the case for a lot of our audience members. So I'd like to ask our three panelists, why do you think that is? Why is his name not better known? Well, uh, I, I have one theory and, and I just said it. He was very anti-establishment and therefore, um, for example, he was one of the early uh, chairman of the president's conference of the Jewish organizations. And he has sort of been disappeared by that organization. And it was because he, he really took positions that were sort of anti-establishment positions. And if you're not part of the establishment, uh, people don't really promote you. And I must say that uh, uh, I'm indebted to both Michael and Rachel because I think that we wouldn't be having this conversation today were it not for them. I will add that as a historian, I am all too aware how quickly people forget. Uh, Joachim Prince died in 1988, I believe, at the age of 86 years. Uh, a generation has gone by since then. And uh, what was, I think, much more widely known during his lifetime is today confined to a significant film, to a published autobiography, and to a program like this one, whose uh, great merit is to revive the memory of this person whose memory really should not be lost. And I just want to add that I think that people who complicate categories and identities the way that Rabbi Prince did are more challenging to you know, craft a narrative about that you know, fits into the boxes that we like to have. And as Jonathan says, he was pretty deliberate about this. And I think in, in a way would have been happy about that but um so you know e even even people like martin luther king um you know there's been a very simplified oversimplified narrative created about martin luther king um similarly malcolm x um so i think that you know if if your if your life resists that kind of simple narrative it it becomes harder for people to know what to do with your story. Mm -hmm. um, and we certainly found it challenging, but we tried to bring it all together as much as we could um, without oversimplifying. Um, you did a gorgeous job in your movie. So there is one audience question I wanna to get to, and then we will go to final thoughts. And the question has to do with the last 20 minute, last 20 years of Prince's life uh, after the March on Washington, in other words, what were the issues that, that really motivated him? Uh, Vietnam War, we heard about, what else? Well, you know, I think the civil rights movement did not end with a March on Washington. Hello, <laughs> we're still in it. Um, so I think that that continued to be important for him. Yes, Vietnam, uh, he was an early uh, opponent of the Vietnam War. So those kinds of things uh, certainly were important for him. And then, you know, let's not forget that he was a rabbi of a congregation and he was a, he was a very, uh, there's a touching point in the film actually uh, of a couple, a, a woman who talks about her husband's birthday party to which he arrived. <laughs> that happens to be the grandmother of one of the, of one of the Rachels. And um, that's who he was. He, you know, he went to visit people in the hospital. He officiated people's weddings and funerals and he counseled them when they had marital problems and all those things. He was very much a pulpit rabbi. 
and uh, it, it was not a sideline for him. It was, you know, one of his many centers. Actually, also tying together with that, um, something else that I wanted to say about the remembering him thing, um, he, you know, the, the, the civil rights movement and the relationship of white organizations and leaders to it became more complicated. Um, and so he had to negotiate all of that. And there was also the congregation eventually moving out of Newark, um, which is something that he, um, you know, had to grapple with. Um, and that happened in 1973. Um, so there were a lot of ongoing things, but everything really tied together. I don't think for Rabbi Prince, he felt he was doing anything different when he was, you know, advocating for an end to the war in Vietnam or for women's rights um, than he was doing when he spoke at the March on Washington. Um, and I just wanted to close by saying that at, at, a, at a conference, um, Rabbi Arthur Hertzberg, this was after Prince had given a talk about the relationship of Jewish organizations to the civil rights movement. This was in like the early 70s. And where he basically said that even if we're not invited to be in the leadership, we still need to support the concept of civil rights and civil rights laws and policies. And Arthur Hertzberg afterwards said about Prince that well, we may not all agree with him and we may not even like what he has to say and it might make us uncomfortable to hear it, but nevertheless, he's perhaps the man that we would all most like to be. Wonderful. Michael, let's turn to you next for some final thoughts. Yes. Uh, after the march on Washington, in recalling it, Prince said, it was the greatest religious experience in my life. And I wanna emphasize the word religious because for Prince, religion was not simply a matter of ritual. Ritual, yes, there was, but for him, that was not the most important thing in religion. The important thing in religion was what you do as a human being for other human beings, your commitment to justice for all, Hence, that march was for him not simply political, but the greatest religious experience in his life. That's what I want to conclude with. Jonathan, the last word goes to you today. Yes, and I just to echo what Michael just said, he considered that the most important speech that he ever gave. And he gave a lot of speeches. Uh, yes, I would like to conclude with this because we are living in such a dark time. Uh, unlike Rachel, who wasn't born then, I was at the March on Washington. And it was the most joyous experience that I ever had. It was a joyous day. And it was a very uh, forward-looking and optimistic day. And in, in this time, when we feel so discouraged for many, and and many people for many different reasons feel so discouraged. Let's remember that there is a forward, there is a future, and that we can march together toward it and there will be a better moment. So our Sunday programs are intended to fortify you and to give you a little bit of light uh, in your week and particularly now. So we do hope you'll keep tuning in and we'll see you on the other side of the election in one week's time. And I wanted to thank our fabulous speakers for sharing their insights with us today and thank our audience of whatever political stripe for being here and listening. So thank you all, have a nice rest of your day and be well. <laughs>